Good afternoon, I'm Paul Menner and welcome to today's People Hour webinar, uh, which is on the subject of an overview of redundancy. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes about this topic. Um, hopefully some of you will have seen the LinkedIn posts and our, our adverts on social media. I have an awful lot to live up to thanks to Simon Robinson, so I will try to be marvellous if at all possible. And as Carl Atkinson has pointed out, I won't be telling anyone how to vote if you're listening to this on uh, if you're listening to this after the 8th of June. Uh, today was the day of the general election. But what am I going to cover today? In brief, a definition of redundancy. What does that actually mean? Like most things in employment law, it's a term that's chucked about sometimes. And there is, as usual, a technical legal meaning. I'll talk a little bit about the difference between redundancy and restructuring. Again, two, firms, two terms that are often used interchangeably. What's the difference and is it important? As the title suggested, I'll give an overview of the process for a redundancy exercise. That, that'll probably be the longest part of today, going through stage by stage what I'd recommend should go into a fair redundancy process. And finally, a talk through about selection for alternative roles. And when I say alternative roles, I'm talking about new roles that arise rather than how you select to reduce the number of employees in a role, but I'll also be talking about the former as well. And there is a difference as to how the two should potentially be uh, should potentially be dealt with. If you've got any questions, hopefully on your screen as well as slides, there is the option for you to type in questions. If you type in those questions as I go along, I'm more than happy to deal with them at the end. It's unlikely I'll pick up the questions as I go through, but as I say, I'm happy to deal with those at the end. So if you do have questions, please type them as we go through. As if there aren't any at the time I finish, I'll probably just end the webinar and uh, might miss the opportunity. So firstly, the definition of redundancy. As I mentioned, in common with most employment law concepts, there is a statutory definition of redundancy. And to find that, you route through the Employment Rights Act to section 139. And section 139 of the ERA says that an employee is taken to be dismissed by reason of redundancy if the reason for dismissal is the fact that the employer has ceased or intends to cease carrying on business in the place that, where the employee was employed, carried on uh, ceasing business whatsoever, or, and this is where most of the case law tends to reside, as the first two tend to be less contentious, where the requirements for that business, for employees to carry out work of a particular kind, or for employees to carry out work of a particular kind in the place where the employee is employed, have ceased or diminished or are expected to cease or diminish. Now, what that means is that the definition of redundancy will definitely include the closure of a business. As I say, that's normally relatively non-contentious. If a business closes, Everyone employed in that business tends to be redundant. The closure of a particular place of work, again, there might be an argument about whether or not an employee, particularly an employee who's peripatetic or travels as part of their role, is actually based in a particular location. But again, if there is a closure of an office, again, it's generally pretty much accepted that employees who are employed out of that office, those roles are redundant too. It's the third part of this test, or the third potential option that tends to cause most of the case law and most of the questions. That is to say, a diminishing need for employees to carry out work of a particular kind. And again, that's either generally or in a particular place. So that's the statutory definition. And there is a rebuttable presumption that if an employee is dismissed on this basis, it will be on the grounds of redundancy. Um, of course, an employee can challenge that. And again, if they bring an unfair dismissal claim, can suggest that the dismissal was for another reason. Or alternatively, of course, they can say, well, I accept that it was for the reason of redundancy, but that it was unfair for me to be made redundant. I'll talk a little bit about that when I'm dealing with the process in a short while. So what's the difference then between redundancy and restructuring? Well, there might not be a difference. But equally, there might be. Now, the president of the EAT at the time, um, Judge Burton, actually set this out. And again, this is this is a quote that I've utilised before in submissions to tribunals on the question of redundancy and on the question of restructuring, because frequently employees or their unions might have in mind that redundancy can only come about where a business is struggling, where it's losing money. And of course, that is a situation where redundancy frequently happens. However, 
Redundancy is not exclusive to those situations. If you look back at the definition, it doesn't ever mention that an employer has to do this because he has no money. It is simply that his requirements for, work of a, for employees doing work of a particular kind have ceased or diminished. And the quote from Judge Burton is actually quite, quite useful in this respect because he says, well, redundancy doesn't only arise where there's a poor financial situation. It doesn't only arise where there's a diminution in work in the hands of an employer. It can occur where there's a successful employer with plenty of work, but who perfectly sensibly, as far as commerce and the economics of business are concerned, decides to reorganise his business. Now, it's not an automatic consequence of there being an organisation that there's a redundancy, nor is there a need for a reorganisation in order that there should be a redundancy situation. They are self-standing concepts. But if a business reorganisation leads to a diminution in the requirement for employees carrying out the relevant work, then that organisation leads to a redundancy situation. And if not, not. It's pretty clear. It's quite useful guidance. It might not sound it. It might sound a little bit, um, a little bit self-serving, but it is useful guidance. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that if you are restructuring, and the idea is that rather than having a situation where you've got eight people with all areas of responsibility, and instead you're going to have eight areas and they're going to each individually have areas of responsibility, there might not be a redundancy situation. You might instead have a restructuring or reorganisation situation. Um, proposals to change terms and conditions may give rise to a dispute about whether the changes go to the heart of the job and whether it's because of a, a diminution in the requirement for work of a particular kind. And we do get into, you can often get into this sort of circular argument in terms of saying, well, we had eight people doing just this work. We have no reduced requirement to do this work. We still need eight people to do it. We just need it done in a slightly different way. We're organising it differently. As I say, rather than all eight of you focusing on all areas, each of the eight of you will focus on a specific area or the other way around or something in between. It's just we're going to do it differently, but there is no diminished need for employees. That would be a restructure situation, and that arguably wouldn't be a redundancy situation. Now, if that's the case, and the employee doesn't accept the job that is offered to, or the, the change that is offered to them, and the revised role, there is an argument that this isn't a redundancy, and instead that their dismissal would be for some other substantial reason, what I tend to call the dustbin of fair reasons. And the potential SOSR would be a business reorganisation. And it would still be potentially fair because, of course, SOSR, like redundancy, is a potentially fair reason, depending on circumstances, equity, the merits of the case, etc. The other thing to point out, and I, I do apologise for this being a standard lawyer cop out for not giving definitive advice on any subject, but these cases are highly fact sensitive. If I was to be braver than perhaps I am, I might even suggest that different judges faced with the same question have come to wholly different outcomes. Um, and I suppose it, it is going to depend. It, it is difficult because from the employee's perspective, if he doesn't want this new role on a restructuring, he is going to say, my role is redundant, it no longer exists. The employer is going to say, but I don't have a diminished need for employees, I have the same need for employees. The employee is going to say, yes, but you have a diminished need for the work of a particular kind, i.e. that job role, because look, that job role is not in your new structure. And as I say, you get into this sort of circular argument. Um, so what do you do in that type of situation? Well, if you are purely looking at a restructure, first thing is I would always, always, always call it a reorganisation or a restructure and I would never utter the word redundancy as any part of it. Um, if it is a standalone reorganisation, you're not looking to lose any numbers. In fact, often you're looking to increase numbers. If you are not looking to have anybody leave on the grounds of redundancy, etc., don't call it a redundancy at all. Call it a reorganisation. But I would still suggest that you follow a redundancy type process as per the advice that I'm going to give through the rest of this talk. So what would you still do? Well, you'd still collectively consult because Section 188 of Tulurka still applies, Tulurka being the Trade Union Labour Relations Consolidation Act. Now, what that says is where you make 20 or more roles redundant, 
you need to collectively consult for a period of 30 days or more with elected representatives or, un or the union, if they're in place and representing all employees within that group. Obviously, if it affects 90, if it affects 100 or more employees, then that period is extended to 45 days. And this comes before pretty much you do anything else. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about collective consultation. I'm going to duck the issue again in a, in a couple of minutes when I'm talking about redundancies, because in fairness, I or one of my colleagues could do a talk for an hour alone on the provisions of Tlerka. However, um, if you are changing the roles of 20 or more employees, i.e. those roles are not in the new structure, it is likely that for the purposes of the collective redundancy consultation uh, legislation, you would need to collectively consult. Whether or not you're looking to actually lose a single employee, even if you're not proposing to lose a single employee, but you are changing the jobs of 21 people, you would still, 20 or 21 people, you would still be obliged to collectively consult. I would also advise you in this restructuring or reorganisation situation to individually consult. I'd advise you to seek alternatives, which would be, generally speaking, the new roles that are on offer, the roles that we would like you to move into, please, as well as other vacancies that you have throughout the business. I would still advise you to invite in writing to a final meeting. Probably the ACAS code doesn't apply in such a situation. However, I would still advise you to do everything that the ACAS code says to do, because those are the types of things that employment tribunals believe are an employee, an employer acting fairly. So I would still say to invite him right into a final meeting, explaining why and the fact that dismissal might result from the final meeting if the employee doesn't accept the new role, one of the new roles that are being offered. I'd allow accompaniment to that final meeting. Again, I don't believe there's a statutory right. I'd do it anyway. Confirm the decision in writing and give a right of appeal. Now, in that type of situation, if you are not calling it a redundancy and you are trying to push for that, the argument would be that the employee is not entitled to a statutory or contractual redundancy payment. Again, you might choose to provide one in any event, but if you were seeking to do it in this way to avoid payment of a redundancy payment, that would probably be the reason why you'd call it a reorganisation and why you'd be trying to avoid that situation arising. If the employee did try to sue in that situation, you would probably plead that under an SOSR basis of business reorganisation, you would plead redundancy in the alternative. You can actually plead both and the process that you'd have followed would probably be fair in respect of both. And then it's up to a tribunal, one, whether it's a fair dismissal, which it could well still be, and two, whether or not the employee is entitled to a redundancy payment, if that was the reason for following this type of process rather than a redundancy process. So that's the difference that I think a reorganisational restructure would make rather than a, strictly speaking, redundancy process. Frequently, the two are as one. So what's the process then for a redundancy, a redundancy procedure itself? Well, again, there's, there's actually, there's no statute that sets this out. All of these issues, all of these matters have come from case law and likewise, the ACAS guide for disciplinary grievances doesn't specifically doesn't cover redundancy processes. So the things that I'm going to suggest arise out of case law, but there is rather a lot of case law with regard to fair redundancy process and what the courts expect employers to do. And again, what the courts, what the tribunals expect the employers to do is often put in slightly different headings to the to the eight that I've provided, but these are the types of things that an employer should be doing in order to demonstrate that a redundancy process is fair. Now again, I'm going to make the same caveat that I made in terms of reorganisation. This presumes 19 or fewer redundancies at one establishment. Now, Again, when I use the term redundancies, I'm not talking about actual people who are going to be leaving the building. I mean roles that you're removing from a structure. Even if you are creating new roles to replace some or all of those, it doesn't matter. The number of redundancies is the number of roles going. So, for instance, if you were changing a structure so that actually you were deleting 22 roles, but you were in fact creating 25 new ones. So actually you were thinking not only is nobody going to be leaving us on the grounds of redundancy, in fact, we're going to be recruiting more people. There would still be an obligation to collectively consult because you were eradicating those roles. 
I'm not going into any more depth on that. As I say, um, it is a flag. It is a speak to your employment law partner at Gunner Cook if you want a bit more information about that. Um, but it is something to bear in mind that even if you are not proposing a single person leaves the building, you might still have made 20 or more redundancies and triggered a collective consultation obligation, which if you fail to comply with, could result in three months pay per affected employee. Quite a, quite a heavy price to pay. So, if we're looking at 19 or fewer redundancies at one establishment, the first thing that an employer should really be looking to do is make a proposal. You need to be considering pooling. You need to be considering how you are going to select within those pools which employees are going to be leaving. So within a pool of, say, I don't know, eight accountants and you need to lose two, you need to come up with a selection method to reduce from eight to six. You need to look at alternatives to dismissal, which is generally new roles. How are you going to select for those new roles? which may or may not be the same as how you decide who's keeping their jobs within the pool. Consultation, and I've put it at point six, albeit that consultation probably um, kicks in quite early. And you would, again, in the ideal fair process, you would be consulting about the pool, about the method of selection, about the alternatives, etc., with employees on an individual basis. Again, a fair process would tend to involve a dismissal hearing. Uh, at which the employee is invited in writing, etc. As I mentioned, no ACAS code, but what is expected by tribunals are ordinary standards of fairness, and they do expect the employee to be invited to a writing, invited in writing to a final meeting, advised why, etc. Um, and an appeal. An appeal process, again, is, is part of a fair dismissal process. So I'll go into those in a little bit more depth. So to begin with the proposal, Frequently, this is called the business case. And again, it tends to be that a business case will go to a board um, in determining that actually either, yes, we're not making enough money and therefore we need to make some redundancies or we've lost this contract. We need to make some redundancies or even as, um, as Judge Burton alluded to in the earlier case, in the Kingwell case, it might well be actually we're doing rather well. However, because of, because of an automation or because of various efficiencies, we don't need six people to do this anymore. We can actually get by with three doing it. Again, all perfectly legitimate um, causes for setting out a business case or proposing a potential redundancy. Now, again, before consider or before making redundancies, there are various different things that an employer should do because the general consensus from the courts on these things is that ultimately redundancy, redundancy should be a last resort. So again, an employer acting reasonably would look at alternatives to redundancy, which might well include a recruitment freeze. I would have thought that should be a prerequisite in fairness. An overtime ban or certainly at least looking to reduce the use of overtime. Potentially short term working or layoff if you have the contractual right. It seems to be used a lot less frequently these days. Pay freezes or potentially pay cuts to employees. I'll come back to that in a minute. Unpaid sabbaticals if staff want to take them. There might also be other suggestions. Um, a diminution in the or, or ceasing to use agency staff is another one. Um, one that used to be in there is, is getting rid of fixed term staff first. Now, again, that is possibly unlawful under the fixed term uh, employment regs. So, again, it's, it's worth considering the position of fixed term staff and the renewal of their contracts. It's worth having a look at and again, having a chat with having a chat with your employment lawyer just in terms of what should we be doing? Is it permissible? There might be a good reason why you might retain somebody on a fixed term, for instance, different skills, etc. There might be a short amount of work, etc. as to why you wouldn't include them or why you might still include them within the pool. I'll talk about pooling in a second. I said I'd come back to pay freeze and cuts. Um, again, the proposal stage. It is, is actually a very useful stage and it, it, it sometimes shows the value of, of both setting out a good business case and proposal and the value of consultation. I've worked with various employers in a situation where they've proposed a number of redundancies and in that situation they've gone out to collective consultation and actually the trade union involved have come back and said the workforce as a whole have said rather than making these redundancies that they will all agree to take a percent or five percent pay cut. Now actually in that situation the employer was able to avoid all redundancies. The unions were the winner, they 
it, it was it was a, a good message for staff morale. Nobody liked the idea of having a whatever it was four or five percent pay cut, but the workforce as a whole was happier to do that. And in that situation, it was a win-win for the employer because they actually retained more staff, but brought down their costs. So again, it's it's a it's a good example of how consultation, which I'll come on to generally in a second, can work very effectively for an employer. Within the proposal, the employer should set out the roles that it's proposing to reduce and the proposed pooling for those roles uh, and the suggested method of selection. It should also set out that uh, whether or not volunteers will be considered. The proposal should be uh, should be announced to affected employees, whether in a group meeting or otherwise. Uh, again, a fair, a very fair process would be an employer saying, well, any suggestions, recommendations, proposals, will consult with regard to what we're proposing at this stage should be made within a short period of time, perhaps within a few days. And again, if you're going to ask for volunteers, that should be done and give a deadline for that. Now, there is no absolute requirement to accept volunteers, but if you're going to refuse to accept volunteers from within a pool, so as I, in my situation of, I don't know, I've got eight accountants and I need six of them. If one of the accountants volunteers for redundancy, you're going to need a very good reason, a very good business reason for not accepting that voluntary redundancy. Ultimately, a redundancy is supposed to be a no-fault dismissal, and if you're saying we're entering into this with an open mind, we need six from, you know, we only need six from eight. If people are volunteering to take that down to six, you should not really be objecting to the identity of who it is. Now, there's no absolute rule for that, but you will need a good business reason to decline. Sometimes it's the situation that you'll say, well, actually, we, we, we've got eight, we need six, and you'll have three expressions of interest in volunteering. If that is the situation, you as an employer can choose which of those three you choose to accept and which you choose to reject. And you can, uh, however, again, you, you've got a reasonably free reign as long as your rationale for doing so isn't discriminatory, probably directly discriminatory or indeed indirectly discriminatory either. So again, it's worth considering your rationale because usually you're going to be committing to writing the reason why you did that. Now, it's not absolutely required that you have to ask employees for their input on your proposed polling, on the proposed selection criteria. It does, however, make it fairer if you do so. It reduces the opportunity that employees later have at a tribunal or later on within the process to say, well, it wasn't a fair pool, the pool was wrong, or it wasn't a fair selection method. It, was an un you know, it, it wasn't right, it, it unfairly prejudiced me in this way. If they don't shout beforehand, it makes it a lot harder for them to suggest later on that, that it wasn't right. Frequently employers don't actually want to do that. Frequently employers will say, well, actually, I don't want to disrupt, particularly in sales, I don't want to disrupt the whole of my sales team. If, I'm, if I've got 20 salesmen and I need to reduce it by two, I'd rather just do my pooling, do my selection in advance and only then notify the two who are in the drop zone, if you like. I'm not saying it's definitely unfair and I understand the commerciality behind that because there's, there's no wish to disincentivize or demotivate the other 18. Um, however, it makes it less fair than it would be if you do as is set out um, and ask for recommendations, etc. and comments at the outset. So pooling. Now, pooling is within the reasonable discretion of the employer, provided he applies his mind to the appropriate pool. And again, in certain situations, it's flaming obvious. In other situations, it's less obvious. Um, for instance, if you have two production lines and the reality is that staff interchange between them, um, there's holiday cover between the two, people move between those lines, two distinct parts of a process but ultimately all of the employees are skilled enough to work on both lines but one of those lines for whatever reason mechanization or, or, or drop-in orders has to be reduced it would seem somewhat arbitrary to just say well the employees who happen to be on that line will be the ones considered for redundancy so when looking at the pool you should be looking at the type of work 
whether employees are doing similar work or interchangeable tasks, whether they have interchangeable skills. You should be looking at whether or not you've got within a, a redundancy procedure yourselves or otherwise an agreed procedure or a union agreement that sets out what the pooling will be. And again, if you have, you would need a very good business reason to disregard that or change that. And also previous practice. Now, again, previous practice can point to all or can point away from perceived unfairness. I, I work with an organisation that's got about 15 different layers of professionals um, and they, they they all have different titles. It's junior, uh, junior accountant, for instance, accountant, principal accountant, senior accountant, associate director, regional director, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there are a, a number of different grades. And employees are paid according to their grade, which is very helpful for equal pay purposes. But they're employed within their grade, and they have to apply for promotions uh, to go up and beyond the grade. And despite the fact that the reality is on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, a person in one grade is probably doing an incredibly similar job to the employee in the grade below. The fact that they are advertised as different jobs, the fact that they have to apply for those roles, they're paid at different rates, etc., has meant that they've successfully argued that they shouldn't have to pull wider than that specific job grade, which has been very helpful. Because usually, employers tend to want to keep the pool size small, and generally, employees and their unions want to make the pool size big. Because employees, it tends to feel a lot easier if at least you get marked against your colleagues rather than just being told, well, it's your role, you're in a pool of one, it's you, I'm afraid, and looking no wider than that. Pools of one are permissible, and tribunals shouldn't interfere in the pool that an employer has chosen, provided it's within a range of reasonable responses. For those of you who listen frequently to these webinars, the range of reasonable responses or the band of reasonable responses is a very common employment law phrase it's a wide discretion afforded to employers by employment tribunals so as not to interfere within reasonable within reason where an employer ha has acted within a relatively wide band of responses. It's only where employers act in a way that no reasonable employer would act that a tribunal should get involved and say, no, 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 your pool is wrong. Now, frequently within consultation, employees might suggest bumping and bumping is nowhere near as much fun as it sounds. And bumping essentially means, well, I'm a, I'm a senior solicitor and I accept that my role is redundant because you don't need senior solicitors. But I could do a solicitor's role. I could do a more junior role to, um, to the one that I'm actually doing and I'll do it for that rate of pay and on that, that contract. And what you should do instead is bump my redundancy down to a more junior person who I'm better than. That's what bumping is. Now, again, it's perfectly permissible. There's been a lot of case law. I think it went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and it, it's, it's quite permissible for an employer to bump and bump the redundancy down if it so desires. The reason for dismissal remains redundancy. It is also permissible to refuse. A request should be considered, usually made during consultation, so it should be considered as part of uh, consultation, not automatically dismissed. Um, but a refusal should only be made for a good business reason. So again, there might be plenty of good business reasons. One of them might be, well, we feel it might demotivate you. We have no performance issues with that employee in that role. We don't like the way that that would look to other employees, particularly within that role. Um, there are a number, you know, we, we actually think that the reality is you would want to take a £10,000 pay cut. We think actually you'd be looking elsewhere quite understandably, and therefore, again, we don't think that bumping is suitable or appropriate in this situation. We'd rather keep the redundancy at that level. So it's possible to refuse it, but there should be a good business reason for doing so, and that should be responded to within consultation too. So I'm going to deal with selection in two bases, and there's a reason for that, and that is that selection should potentially be dealt with differently, depending on the circumstances. So selection for reduced roles, again, whether I use my eight accountants or what are the example I put on the slide. 10 managers, reducing it to eight managers, i.e. reducing the number of employees within a single pool. If that's the case, the selection method should be fair and reasonable. Of course it should, you say. Why wouldn't it be? Well, it should also be relatively objective as well, and it should probably be done on a selection matrix. Now, there's no case, again, there's no redundancy act that says that there must be a selection matrix used. But tribunals, and tribunals are 
becoming a little bit more flexible in this regard. But generally, they do tend to expect to see, unless it's agreed with the unions otherwise, a selection matrix used and objective and sensible criteria used to mark employees. So you set up criteria that are linked to your business requirements. There is a genuine and honest assessment of individual employees. The criteria and assessment of them are done consistently. There is an awareness of protected characteristics, i.e. you should be discounting periods of maternity absence, for instance. You should be taking into account the fact that if someone's on maternity leave, they um, it might take long for their bills to be paid because they've not chased them. You might you should be discounting uh, the effects of absence caused by disability, etc. And be flexible where appropriate in that regard. An objective criteria should be utilised at least in part. Now, not in whole, there used to be arguments that selection criteria for a redundancy matrix should be entirely objective. That's definitely not the case now. If the criteria are agreed with unions, whether in collective consultation or otherwise, fabulous. If they're agreed with employees, equally fabulous. If you've put them to the employees as a proposal and said, make any comments about this before we start the process, and they haven't done, well, again, you've probably done the next best thing. And you can say, well, nobody objected, and therefore we felt they were agreed. But what sort of criteria should you use? Length of service? Well, it used to, it used to be the criteria, the single criteria used in redundancy situations. Last in, first out, LIFO. Um, it's unlawful now to use LIFO on its own but it can be a relevant factor among others. So it can be a criterion, it shouldn't be the exclusive criteria. Efficiency. Now efficiency, you might say, hang on a minute, that doesn't sound particularly objective and it's difficult to show how it would be. That potentially subject, a very, well, really quite subjective criteria could be used, or criterion could be used. Experience. Again, experience of doing the role might be relevant, but again, consider in the context of age discrimination, are you, are you not better off potentially looking for something like skills in the role rather than experience? Does 10 years in a role actually make you better than three years in a role? Um, could you do a shorter period or look at something different? Attendance, so absence from work could well be, uh, could be something, again, very objective. Again, consider disability, pregnancy related, possibly emergency care for dependents should be excluded from that. Employees disciplinary records, excellent, highly objective. Productivity and performance, probably quite a subjective criteria. But again, if you have recent appraisals, um, it could be a lot more objective. It could be dealt with, it could be shown in a lot more objective way, i.e. if you scored a one on your last appraisal or on your 2016, 2017 appraisal, or whatever it is, you get X number of points. If you scored a two, you get Y number of points, etc. Theoretically, it's subjective, but it looks quite an objective type of criteria when put in that perspective. If not, if you don't have those up-to-date appraisals for all employees, because bear in mind you should be doing it in a consistent way, um, then it will probably would be a more subjective assessment, which again, if you have a couple of people doing it, or at least a check and balance, and equally you should be able to substantiate in some reasonable way the rationale for that decision or that scoring. And again, qualifications and skills within that role. It's no, you know, if it's a, I don't know, if it's working for an accountancy firm, it doesn't matter whether or not someone's got their cycling proficiency badge, frankly. So again, qualification and skill for that role, whether they have a qualification that is necessary for that role, or even things that are useful to a business as a whole. First aid certificates, for instance, might be relevant, particularly if you have got a close run thing. Now, I've talked a little bit about objectivity and subjectivity. Um, those of you who aren't Blackadder fans, I'm sorry, this might go slightly over your head, but um, but in a fabulous episode of uh, Blackadder Goes Forth, General Melchett had a discussion with Captain Blackadder in which he actually was talking about security and said, security is not a dirty word, Blackadder, and went on to state various things that were dirty words, which I don't propose to repeat. The reason I put this, uh, this slide in is not to profess my love of uh, Great British comedy, but is rather to point out that... President Underhill of the Employment Appeal Tribunal uttered a very similar phrase uh, within a redundancy case. And the case that he mentioned it in was Samsung and Monte de Cruz. 
Um, as I say, you'll see from the first sentence, subject, I, I, won't, I won't do the voice, but subjectivity is often used in this and similar contexts as a dirty word. It is not a dirty word, essentially, he went on to say. He, he says, all aspects of performance or value of an employee don't necessarily lend themselves to objective measurement. Crikey, this is a good case. This, again, is a quote that I've frequently used in tribunal when defending redundancies. And there's no obligation on an employer always to use such criteria which are capable of such measurement. And certainly not in the context of an interview for alternative employment. He was actually referring to a case for a new role, which I'll come on to in a second. But he makes the point generally that not all criteria have to be objective. There should though be some sort of objectivity I would recommend. So again, on the same, on the same topic, if you are selecting within a pool, you should score reasonably, um, i.e. one day off doesn't equate to 50% of the maximum mark for that criterion. One day off should equate to just about all of the, all of the sc scores for that particular criterion. So it should be, it should be reasonable. Um, employees should be scored against criteria, not against one another. So again, if it is going to be, uh, it, there should be criteria set out so that, for instance, absent, you are clear in advance that not to, not to three days absence in the previous year equates to 10 points, four to six days of absence equates to eight points, et cetera, et cetera. So that employees are scored against the criteria. It's not just whoever's best gets 10, whoever's worst gets one. Compare like for like. So up to date appraisals for all same periods of absence, same periods for warnings, etc. It shouldn't be that you're stretching the year for one person and not for another. Have at least one person scoring or at least a check and balance um, so that it's not just one person's entirely subjective opinion. Do you need a tiebreaker if two employees right on the line are tied? I mean, you'd be pretty unlucky if that was the case. But if that was the case, should you have a tiebreaker? Should it be length of service? Would you offer an interview, for instance, just as an absolute tiebreaker to say, well, we can't part the two of you? Or do a test or assessment? Now, I'm going to talk about maternity leave here a little bit because there are special provisions about maternity leave in redundancy situations. But what the maternity and parental etc. leave regulations do not say is they do not say employees on maternity leave are automatically safe. Employees on maternity leave should be assessed with the other employees in their pool. Now, there is a provision about employees on maternity leave, I'll come on to it, but it is for alternative roles. If you're assessing eight down to six, the employee on maternity leave doesn't necessarily get one of those six roles. She is assessed alongside all of her colleagues. If she is unfortunate enough to be in the bottom two, she does get a preference on new roles, I'll come on to that in a second, um, but she doesn't automatically get to keep her role. Now, the other thing that shouldn't occur is that you shouldn't artificially inflate the employee on maternity leave's score um, or reduce others' scores in order to manipulate or ensure that she is not prejudiced. Again, you should attempt to score reasonably, but there might be criteria in which someone on maternity leave cannot be scored because they're simply not there. So the assessment period being the last year and they've not been there for nine months of the last year, for instance. What you should not do in that situation, as a very well-known law firm did in a, relative, in a relatively famous redundancy case, is you shouldn't artificially increase the score on that particular criterion to an unrealistic level. So in that particular case, um, in the, I won't name the law firm, but the case was Eversheds versus De Berlin. Um, the law firm in question uh, had an employee who was off on maternity leave and they were looking at lock up, which is the amount of time between uh, between doing the work and being paid, which is obviously a big issue in service industries, um, was one of the criteria being measured. The employee on maternity leave wasn't around for the whole of that year, and so they automatically gave her the highest possible score that she could get, despite the fact that that didn't reflect what her lockup was like in any other year, and put her way ahead of her colleagues. And what that resulted in ultimately is her colleague, John de Berlin, um, being made redundant and her not being made redundant and doing so was found to be both unfair and sex discrimination. So there should be a reasonable flexibility to ensure that an employee on maternity leave isn't unduly prejudiced. But what you shouldn't do is artificially inflate to preserve their position to the detriment of their colleagues. So that's selection for reduced roles within a pool. Now, there is a contrast between that and alternative new roles. So new roles are roles that weren't on the old structure. These are brand new roles and employees are entitled to apply for them. Now, 
when you're selecting who to put into these new roles, there is significantly more discretion in your method of selection than there should be in your reducing roles within a pool. Reducing roles within a pool, 10 to 8 or 8 to 6, you should be using a matrix, you should be using a balance of objective and subjective criteria, etc. When selecting for a new alternative role, I won't say you can do anything you like, but you have a significant degree more discretion. It's far more a question of judgment, and an interview process may well be permissible. Rather than taking any of those previous considerations about attendance, disciplinary record, etc., etc., into account, you can either interview or otherwise and say, well, actually, we think the best person for this new role, bearing in mind it's a new role, so you'd actually know what the performance would be like, we think the best person will be this person. Um, and you can do that, as I say, without without going through the same formality and the same sort of objective tests as you would have to to reduce roles. Um, the case I've put forward is Morgan versus Welsh Rugby Union, uh, but equally the Samsung and Monty de Cruz case was a very similar judgment from President Underhill. Now, in this situation, employees on maternity leave automatically get, without any form of selection exercise, any suitable alternative role if their role is redundant. So. In the situation that I've kept there, and I've out of a reduction from 10 to 8 or a reduction from 8 to 6, whatever it is. If the employee on maternity leave is one of the unlucky two, but there is a new role and she is capable of doing it, she gets that role. And she gets that role without going through an interview process. She gets that role even if other colleagues would be better at it. And she gets the role regardless. That is her right. To not give her that is discrimination and automatically unfair dismissal. So it is, again, that is where the automatic right kicks in for employees on, uh, employees on maternity leave. Why is that the case and not the alternative? I don't know. I don't write the law in this respect. I believe this is put in place, though, to stop the situation of an employer sort of tweaking and rebranding or relabeling a role whilst an employee is off on, uh, off on maternity leave. It is simply the law. Um, it is a slightly tricky quirk between the two different situations. Now, consultation. Whilst I've put consultation quite a long way down this talk, consultation obviously isn't an afterthought at the end. Consultation is something that ideally, and in the most fair process, would have been ongoing. Obviously, in, in a larger scale situation, there would have been collective consultation first. But I've talked about in the fairest way that you can do this, you would consult with employees to begin with, with regard to what you're proposing as the pools and what you regard as your selection criteria. Then once you've carried out an exercise and scored them, you would be expected to enter into individual consultation with an open mind um, and discuss the potential redundancy and the prospect or the proposal of the employee who is at risk. And I would tend to try to use those terms. Um, it's a proposal to make redundancies. They are provisionally redundant, or their role is provisionally redundant. They are currently at risk or provisionally at risk. And consultation is meant to seek ways to avoid the employee's dismissal. So if the employee has been scored, they should be notified of, at the very least, their own score, their own total, their own individual scores, i.e. for attendance you got 10, for performance you got 6, for whatever you got 4. They should be told the scoring method and they should be also told the lowest total safe score. So i.e. you got 48 marks, the lowest person who wasn't made redundant got 56 marks. They don't need to know that person's identity and they don't need to know the composition of that 56 marks. But they should be told the total safe score, their score, etc. And ideally, you'd give them that information before the first consultation meeting, if at all possible, so that they can come prepared. Otherwise, you, you might want to catch them on the hop and what realistically can they do at that first meeting. Obviously, if the employee is in a pool of one, then there isn't going to be any sort of scoring on that basis, and you'll move on to the other aspects. Now, within a consultation exercise, I tend to suggest that consultation, whilst it's supposed to be a two-way process, I would suggest generally you allow the employee, particularly to start with, to have their say, to raise things. I tend not to suggest anyone's too defensive. If they want to say, well, I don't think it's fair because of this, this and this, you make a note and say, right, I understand you say that, I'll, I'll consider that and come back to you. I think the pooling should be wider. OK, could you explain why? Let them have their explanation. OK, I'll rethink that and come back to you. Um, 
Their own individual and total scores, of course, they should be allowed input on those. Again, they are likely to suggest that some of them, particularly the subjective ones, should be higher. And again, certainly in first instance, I'd let them have their say and then come back with, I would tend to suggest, a written response before a second consultation meeting. Now, within the consultation process, you won't necessarily reach agreement, but it's important to allow the employee to have their say before making a final decision. That's what, again, the tribunals and, and the AT have tried to suggest, that employees should be able to have an input. At the end of the day, you've got lots of bands of reasonable responses. You've got bands of reasonable, you, the proposal, the business proposition is entirely under your discretion. If you want to make a bad business decision, employees got no right to object to that, nor is a tribunal. Likewise, you've got nice ranges of reasonable responses in terms of the pooling, in terms of your selection methods and things. So it's important, however, that you don't just go in and say, well, we've decided this, it's tough. Um, a key component is that the employee is entitled and able to just have their say before you make a final decision. There should be a thorough discussion of alternatives. Now, again, the best way to do this, I tend to think, is provide the employee with details and so that you've got a written record of all new roles and all vacancies within the company and the group of companies and allow them to apply. So, look, these are all our vacancies. You can apply for any of them, essentially. Don't discount any. Don't say, ah, well, this person works in production, so, you know, we won't tell them that there's a vacancy for a financial accountant. Just give them the vacancies. Do you know what? You do not know. Firstly, you don't know going upwards what qualifications they've got prior to working for you. And secondly, you don't know downwards how far they're prepared to go in terms of ensuring that they maintain their job. So don't discount anything. I would suggest you do point in particular towards very suitable roles, particularly if you're suggesting that they're not expressing an interest. You might ask why, but ultimately it's your part of looking at alternatives. It probably involves at least trying to point them towards suitable alternatives. Consultation. Again, there's no cut and dried on this. There's no specifics set out in legislation or by tribunals. I tend to think tribunals want consultation periods to be at least a week and at least a couple of meetings. There's nothing set in stone on that. Once consultation is coming to a conclusion or comes to or consultation tends to come to a conclusion at a dismissal hearing. And again, the ACAS code doesn't formally apply to this, but even so, I tend to strongly suggest that you notify employees of the hearing in writing or the final meeting in writing, explain the rationale. Again, I think this is a good opportunity to reiterate what you've done fairly and well. So the fact you had a business case in brief, not everything, you know, not the full half page that was read out to employees, but due to a drop in orders, or whatever it is. The steps you've taken to avoid redundancy, the fact that you have cut agency staff, recruitment freeze in place for months, etc., still hasn't had the desired effect, sought volunteers, they weren't forthcoming. The, the pooling that you've done, the fact that, you know, they are the managers and therefore they've been pulled together and you took into account what they said, but ultimately concluded that that was the appropriate pool. What you went through on selection, the fact that there had been a period of consultation and that you'd sought alternatives, but unfortunately, despite what had been offered, they decided they didn't want to go for any of those or whatever it is, you know, set that out in writing. Again, if you're setting it out in writing and the employee doesn't object to it, it makes it harder for them to later suggest that wasn't the case. The employee should be notified in advance that a potential outcome might be the dismissal on the grounds of redundancy. I tend to, again, allow them to be accompanied. As it, I don't believe they have a statutory right, but I'd still allow them to be accompanied by a union rep or colleague. Allow them again to have their say and then make a decision. You then confirm that in writing, confirm how much they get as their redundancy payment, confirm whether they're working their notice, which often you wouldn't. As a quick tip, um, if an employee is working their notice or is on guard leave during their notice period, you are still obliged to continue to search for alternatives throughout the duration of that period. If you pay in lieu of notice, your obligation ceases immediately because they cease being an employee immediately. Might not be relevant, it's sometimes worth thinking about. Um, and obviously details of the holiday pay, etc., which presumably will have accrued until that point. Confirm their right of appeal. The right of appeal should be with a more senior individual. I t as a general rule for all appeals, not just in redundancy, I tend to suggest that any appeal manager, regardless of how limited the appeal is that's put forward, that the appeal manager maintains that they've reconsidered everything. They've reconsidered the business case, the consultation, etc., and they believe it's all been done appropriately. If ever there is a procedural defect in the initial procedure, tribunals can look to a fair appeal, and if it has been comprehensive, they can say, well, it makes absolutely no odds. And in the past, I've worked for employers and been to tribunal, and that's been just the case. There was a, a quirk or a flaw in the initial decision, but because of the fullness and the thoroughness of the appeal, the tribunal said, well, that makes no difference because you still had a fair hearing. 
and of course confirm the appeal outcome in writing. So that's what I suggest your process ideally would look like. I do appreciate that we don't live in an ideal world and there might be a multitude of factors that push against that. That might seem like quite a long process. You might want to abridge it. I've suggested that there's a proposal and that you consult and put in the, that wider pool of employees at risk and notify them all. You might well not want to do that because you might not want to demotivate that sales force when actually you're only going to make one or two redundancies. I understand that. But however, that is a process that should look fair if it is followed. So the final thing I suggested I was going to talk about was alternative employment. So alternative employment is of course terrific because if an employee succeeds in an application for a new role, well, redundancy doesn't happen. They continue to be employed. Hooray. Um, they don't sue you for unfair dismissal. Hooray. And, um, and they carry on working for you, which is excellent. Obviously, that doesn't always take place. Uh, there is a trial period for alternative employment of four weeks for either party to say it's not working and in which case redundancy rights are preserved. Obviously, if you allow them a trial and then say it's not working, the employee can still claim unfair dismissal. They theoretically could do if they said it wasn't working, but I think it, they'd be unlikely to succeed. The other thing I should say about suitable alternative employment arose from something I was mentioning earlier. Now, in a situation where you are doing a restructuring, you're trying not to actually make anyone redundant, but you've changed the way their roles go. Or you have called it a redundancy and you said someone's redundant, but you've offered them an alternative role that you believe is a suitable alternative role. The employee can reject it. Now, why is this relevant? Well, a redundancy payment is not payable if an employee unreasonably refuses suitable alternative employment. Now, it's key to mention that that is a two part test. Firstly, it must be suitable alternative employment, which is an objective test. And secondly, the employee must unreasonably refuse it, which is a subjective test. So the first part, suitable alternative employment, that generally is any role. They're offered any role that's not enormously dissimilar. That is probably suitable alternative employment. And obviously, if the employee accepts it, that's suitable alternative employment. That's fine. If you make an offer to an employee that is very similar to their existing terms, the same pay, the same hours, but reporting differently and the employee rejects it, you might say, or, or indeed if it's slightly less pay or the same pay overall, but they get less allowance or they get slightly less overtime or whatever it is, you might well say, well, this is suitable alternative employment. Therefore, if you don't accept it, we're not paying you a redundancy payment. Now, I didn't put it on the slides, but I'll say it. You really, really don't win on these arguments, I'm afraid. There are certain things where it is a good position to be an employer and you do win. Bands of reasonable responses, good to be an employer. You generally win. Not paying employees redundancy payments, not good for the employer. Good for the employee, you generally lose. It's very rare for, empl for employment tribunals to find that a rejection is unreasonable by an employee. And again, there's case law about, for instance, very small reductions in pay and nothing else changing. And it wasn't unreasonable for the employee to say, well, I don't want any reduction in pay. Or where there were slightly different hours, the employee said, well, unfortunately, that affects my childcare. Which tribunal would find that somebody not being able to take up a role because it affected their childcare was unreasonable on the part of the employee? It isn't, and it's a subjective test. So it's very, very difficult to succeed on that. So if an employee's role does go, if they are redundant, it's pretty much up to them if they want to take another role. And if they don't, it's very, very likely that they will be paid their redundancy payment if they try to enforce it. Even if you say you're not going to pay it in the first instance, they tend to usually win in tribunal. And again, alternative employment, I'm just going to flag this again for employees on maternity leave. So employees on maternity leave don't automatically avoid selection for redundancy, but once selected, should automatically be given any suitable alternative role. Um, you can give notice to an employee who's on maternity leave. So again, if, if they've not succeeded um, and you do make them redundant, notice can take place during maternity leave. You can also change someone's role whilst they're on maternity leave. They can agree to change their contract and take up a new position. I would tend to suggest that you agree that the trial period commences on their return to work rather than having a four week trial period when they're not at work. Um, that would seem to be common sense. If that occurs, obviously, if, if an employee does on maternity leave, does automatically slot into a role, um, that usually creates an additional fixed term vacancy for that role whilst they remain on maternity leave, which might be a suitable alternative for another employee for a period of time. 
as a quick NB and not much of one, um, arguably when that fixed term contract expires, that could well be SOSR rather than redundancy. I just flag it. However, I think it will be a particularly mean-spirited employer who said in that situation, sorry, you've foregone your redundancy rights. We're not paying you a redundancy payment because covering maternity leave is an SOSR. Um, I'll leave it no further than that. There is some case law to that effect, though. So a brief summary, having spoken for 50 odd minutes, um, is it a redundancy situation? It is a redundancy situation if work of a particular kind is diminishing, although it's going to be fact sensitive about what work of a particular kind means. Follow a redundancy process, crikey, there's good advice. Obviously I've set out what I would purport is a relatively fair process. If you have your own uh, contractual process or your own, pro your own policy, you should also be following that as a bare minimum. You do as an employer win, if you like, in that you have a wide discretion on the pool and the selection method, but in an ideal world, you'd consult on them to make it even fairer still. Consult on them, you don't have to agree to it. And if you did, imagine how fair that looks to a tribunal. You get more discretion still in selection for new roles than you do in uh, reducing roles within a pool. There are special rules for employees on maternity leave. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that they don't get selected, but they, should, they do get first dibs on new jobs, even if they're not the best candidate. And you tend not to win arguments about refusal of alternative employment. I'll put it no higher than that. That's me concluded for today. Um, just I, I, a couple of things I've just finalised with. The first is that we have a pensions webinar, uh, which is going to be at the end of June. So look out for the invitation to that in the next couple of weeks. And that's going to be presented by my colleagues, uh, Ginevra Gattrell and Martin Scott, uh, which will be fabulous. Um, let me just check. I, I haven't got any questions. I was dreading getting a question dreading getting a question with regard to maternity leave again and having to answer it for a third or having to say it for a second or third time but um, if you do have any queries if you do post them up on your screen um, we will contact you after today and, uh, and respond to those but thank you ever so much for listening and uh, and I'll say goodbye and make sure you vote